Hi, I'm Sandy Scheller and I'm with Heidi Langbein Allen. You're probably wondering why we're doing it this way. It's because Heidi had an emergency that she needed to do. She came here on Sunday. We're going to do the presentation for you. And if there are any questions or anything, I'll take them down at the end, get them to Heidi, get your email, and then answer you back that way. So without further ado, I introduce to you Heidi Langbein Allen. Heidi, you have a story to tell us about a man who was a boy, could not control what his destiny was going to be. And I would love for you to start telling me about you and the relationship that you had with your father. Well, Sandy, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it, it's, it's really a privilege for me to be able to share my father's story. And, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. So um, again, my name is Heidi Langbein Allen. Um, my father, uh, Willi Langbein, uh, was born in 1930. Uh, and was uh, recruited into uh, the Nazi uh, youth organization um, very young, at, at the age of 10, um, because it was mandatory at, at the, by the time my father turned 10. And this is his story. So it's a story of what happened to him uh, during the Nazi era and during the war. And he uh, and his survival uh, of it and um, what what he did with that experience uh, and how he attempted to right or wrong you know he couldn't change the past but he he decided to do his part to, to change the future and I think the, this story is important to share and to pass along to uh, to others um, as a reminder of what autocracy can do to a civilization uh, and how it can eliminate free will and create uh, extremism and violence. Did his mother and father tell him that if he didn't do this, that the whole family was gonna get killed? Or what were the ramifications for your father? And I'd like to go one step. Does, did your father have any brothers or sisters? No, he was, uh, my father was an only child. Um, and my father, again, was born in 1930. So in 1933, Hitler came to power right, as the, uh, when the Reichstag was set on fire. And purportedly it was the communists, but you know, now it's pretty well known that it was, you know, it was the Nazis who used it as an excuse for Hitler to come to power, take emergency powers and, and never relinquish them. Um, and in 1935, uh, school books started to get rewritten. With the, the narratives changed uh, in an almost subtle way, but the wording changed. For instance, from focus on family and church, uh, words were introduced like blood and soil and fatherland. And so it crept into uh, the school education in 1936, my father was enrolled in school, so those books were already changed. Um, and it, it, so it was, a very, it was a very focused and subtle indoctrination of youth because the aim of the Nazis was to um, basically develop a generation of people who would be unquestioning of the ideology and of their authority. Uh, so, you know, molding young minds is, is actually relatively easy. Uh, and that's what they did. So by the time in 36 he went to school, you know, that was, that was what they had in the school books. And in 1939, as we all know, the, the war started. Um, Germany invaded Poland. Uh, world War II began. England declared war. My father, at age 10, was then enrolled into the precursor of the Hitler Youth, which is called the Jungfolk. This is an organization very similar to uh, the Boy Scouts, right? These were organizations that are already existed. The Germans were very fond of uh, youth outdoor activities and group uh, organizations such as, uh, very similar to the Boy Scouts. What Hitler did was leverage that, uh, those organizations to build an organized, uh, an organized method to indoctrinate children. 
So while those organizations were voluntary before, by the time my father turned 10, which is when the youngest boys were uh, put into that, uh, into that organization, um, it was mandatory. It was no longer uh, an option. So he simply was enrolled automatically at age 10 into what's called, what was called the Young Folk. That lasted four years. Then the kids graduated from Young Folk at 14 to Hitler Youth, Hitler Jugend, from 14 to 18. And during the war, uh, those boys at 18 were immediately enrolled in, uh, in the German uh, armed forces. Heidi, did your father have blonde hair, blue eyes? Did he look Aryan or was he a little boy that didn't look like it? Your, your typical Aryan and now all of a sudden, um, to g give me a description of your father. At no, the age of 10. my father was actually a redhead, carrot red hair. He had so many freckles, he looked like he had a tan. So <laughs> he was, yeah. he was uh, you know, and there was a saying actually in, in Germany that, uh, you know, red hair and freckles made, uh, made uh, good uh, German boys, something like that. And he always thought in, in his older age that it was just, uh, you know, a way to console the redheads, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, when you're 10 years yeah. old, yeah. when you're 10 years old and you're being taken from your mother and father, did he go back like every day to sleep in the home of the parents? No, no, or this- was he in a camp? Where, explain yeah. that, that to yeah. me. The, you know, it was just like the boy, the boy Scouts, right? Except what happened is, um, you know, the activities became more and more regimented and more and more, uh, you know, paramilitary in nature. So, but it was just like you know, your kids going to the Boy Scout meetings. So they had uh, three, I think it was three meetings a week. And it was uh, almost strategically done in a way that, you know, they would take the kids more and more often to do outdoor activities, which were fun, of course, for the boys. But in the meantime, they were teaching them how to march to military parade music, uh, how to do the salute, how to learn the life of Hitler, you know, things of that nature. And then on weekends, they had activities on weekends, in particular on Sundays, so the kids couldn't go to church. Did his mother love this idea of her son going away, marching, being in what was called a German Boy Scouts camp? What was it like for her? Did she understand what, what her son would be learning? The one thing, you know, of course, I don't have, you know, uh, as much information about that, only from what my father told me. My, my grandmother passed when I was 11. I do remember her, but, you know, we never discussed that, obviously. Uh, I do have some snippets of what they might have thought, um, just because uh, they, I, my father told me that they reviewed the school books and that they were, um, it looked to him that they were skeptical about the changes but they were very careful i think not to say anything um, because one of the things that the nazis did was it was teach the children to tell on their parents so one of the episodes that he told me was that they would ask them like in first grade already or second grade um so you know the SS are great and Hitler's our savior, you know, things of that nature. And, uh, and we all have a picture of Hitler in our living room, don't we? And don't your parents tell you about how good Hitler is for Germany? They do, don't they? And so, you know, oh, and, and, and he remembers uh, nodding, not because his parents were doing that, because they weren't, they didn't talk about any of that at home or he didn't remember but he saw that that's what everybody was nodding to so he nodded as well did he have any jewish friends growing up he did he did he actually the the their neighbor the next door neighbors were uh best friends um and uh, the so it was a couple uh a very interesting story a couple the grunebaums who uh were owned a shoe shop a shoe store in Witten, the town of Witten, where my father was born and grew up. And the, the lady 
was, was what you would call Aryan. So she was Christian, German, uh, not of Jewish descent. Her husband was Jewish. Uh, and they had a little boy. And my father used to go very often, every day, I mean, basically grew up there because my grandmother had a lot of ailments. You know, she had, and who knows because it was never diagnosed, we don't know exactly what she had, but she was sick very often. So, um, so the neighbor would babysit my father with her little son, who was about seven, he was a lot younger. He was maybe, I think, six or seven years younger. Um, but he played, my father played with him. With, and, and then as they grew a little bit older, they had, you know, a relationship. And um, fast forward, so what happened there is uh, the Nazis, when things got bad, uh, about 43, or even before, actually 42, I think, uh, told her she needed to divorce her husband. They tried to force her to divorce her husband because that's what they did, and she refused. And so what that did is kind of sealed the fate for her. So she was, he was deported to Theresienstadt. Uh, and she was not, but she was left completely destitute. She was not to be given any aid by anybody. So basically they left her and her child to die. She was not given any food rations, any food stamps. She was not allowed to, uh, to get any food. And, and um, the Christian population was prohibited from giving any assistance, otherwise they would be deported as with her as well to Not concentration a camps. Not thing to do, is it? And no. Uh, so my grandmother I ignored that, uh, and she she did help her friend uh, subreptitiously as much as she could. And then, and this is much later. My father didn't know until after the war when she finally told him the story. Uh, she, uh, I think my grandparents, you know, I've been asked, well, did they do anything? And I said, well, they, they mostly kept their head down and their mouth shut, but they had their heart in the right place. And they did hide uh, Mrs. Grunebaum and, and her child at the end of the war in their coal cellar at great risk to themselves, because they would have, at the end in, you know, 44, 45, they would have taken her. In because the the Nazi regime had become desperate, and it was um, you know they were they were um, they were killing soldiers, uh, German soldiers who got lost or separated from their units. They were rounding up everybody who even gave a whiff of you know minor dissent or doing anything. So they would have um, the, the 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 woman would have been deported. Now the good news, and the interesting part of this story is that she. Mr. Grunebaum survived Theresienstadt, and he walked home. And I think their love was so great that he agreed to stay in Germany. He's one of the few. Witten only had, literally, we know this because of the census, 427 Jewish residents. I believe he may have been one of the very few that, that stayed after the war. And that store still stands. It's still the shoe store, still in its original place, actually across the street because that part was bombed. So they reconstructed. And I was able, I had the privilege to go a couple of years ago. Um, and I found the heir to the Grunebaums, who is a woman very close to my age because she's the daughter of the little boy who played with my father. I didn't even know she existed. They still run the store, and, uh, and it was delightful to meet her, and she corroborated the story. She says, yes, my grandmother told me that her good neighbor hid her and saved her life. Now comes the war. What did your father do? What were things that happened to him? This is going to be a loaded question. Yeah. Um, did he get hurt? Was he lied to? So if you yeah. can bring me in as to what happened during the wartime, yeah. from when he entered yeah. to what his life was like when the war came to an end. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll rewind just a little bit to give you a, a, a little bit of background as to how that happened, him getting into the war, because he was actually way too young to be enlisted okay. um, in the army. Thank you. So, um, it, so age 10, so that's 1940, he gets into the Jungfolk, like all little boys. By 1943, he's now, he's 13 years old, 
um, the bombing had become against Germany had become quite intense because you know the war had taken a turn for the worse for the Germans the Allies were were gaining a lot of ground and and Germany was being bombed very heavily uh, by the Allied forces so there was an organization called Kinderlandverschickung it was a program and can and you in the trans that word again slower <laughs> so people kind can hear what that word is it's the KLV and it's Kinderlandverschickung which means you know loosely the translated children. as children's relocation to the country to the program country. it was under the guise of protection uh, against Allied bombing so they were taking the children from their parents and moving them to places quite far away from their parents under again under the pretext of protecting them from allied, allied bombing which was clearly not the only reason one of the main reasons was to completely separate them from the influence of parents and church and fully indoctrinate these children in these now be desperate times because at 43 the war had already turned knowing that potentially they could lose and they needed reinforcements so they were going to prepare these children to get thrown into war as basically cannon fodder which is exactly what happened to my dad in 1945. So at 40, in 1943 at 13 years old he and many many others I mean hundreds of thousands of children were taken into this program. Now this is the funny part. So that was a, vol a voluntary program because it was like a vacation in the countryside. That's how it was literally purportedly shown to the parents uh, and advertised. Parents, uh, when parents didn't show enough enthusiasm for the program because no parent in their right mind did wanted their child to just disappear. Um, then they made it not mandatory, but they made it such that it would be very difficult to avoid. So for instance, in that area where my parents lived, or my, my grandparents lived in North Rhine-Westphalia, um, they uh, closed all the schools in 1943. But it was illegal not to send your child to school. Therefore, the only option you had to not be thrown in jail was to send your kid to the Kinderlandverschickung program where he would be schooled. So that's how they did it. Wow. So they had no choice. Uh, the children were carted off. Uh, he ended up in uh, close to uh, the Swiss border in a city called Konstanz. Uh, when that became, uh, you know, the war, uh, of course, continued to evolve uh, in, in the wrong direction for the Germans, luckily. Uh, the bombing became more intense even in that area, so they moved the children to a remote Alpine village called Schleching, where then, this is now 44, um, my father was selected by the SS who came to visit uh, the school, uh, was selected, handpicked him and two uh, other uh, schoolboys, his, his, his schoolmates, uh, because they were big and strong. So it turns out my father was a, a big man. Uh, he was six foot tall and apparently at that age he was already very tall uh, and looked strong, I guess. So they picked them uh, for training to give their lives to the fatherland. So they carted them off to do military training for not much, mind you. Um, so they weren't very well trained, but for a couple of months. Um, and uh, then sent them back to school. And they said, at a future time, you will be called upon to lay down your life for the Fuhrer, which was, of course, a great honor, uh, purportedly. So that's where we were. Um, and the... It, of course, it got worse. So hunger was pervasive. So at this point, they were near starvation. There was no food. I mean, all the farm animals had been eaten. There was no more farming going on. Uh, there was no, uh, no availability of food. There was no connection to the families. They were completely isolated. And they were desperate. The children were desperate. And um, they resorted to stealing food um, from wherever they could. And stealing from you know the butcher had a cellar they broke into the cellar just to, to eat and um, and then the SS showed up again and this was in early 1945 in I believe it was in January or February uh, and they had a depot with food because you know they were SS was always well fed this little kid uh, schoolmate of my dad's um, made the mistake to break into that depot to swipe some ham and some butter and he got caught red-handed and to set an example the next morning 
that child was executed in front of my father and all of his schoolmates as a message to ensure unquestioning obedience. And that's something my father never forgot. He watched that, that boy being executed by firing squad, a 14-year-old like him. Um, and so a month later, it was his turn. So they told him, that's it. You and your other two uh, uh, schoolmates are, are going off to, uh, to the Eastern Front to defend Germany against the bad Russians. And that's all they knew. And so they got to the front. It took about, it took a few weeks to get there uh, with a convoy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he got to Vienna, just to the gates of Vienna, to a city called Wiener Neustadt, which is right just south of Vienna, in what turned out to be actually the last battle of the Germans in defense of Vienna against the Russian advance at about, it must have been March 31st or April 1st. And that is, you know, it, I looked it up and, and yes, that's exactly when it happened. He didn't know it then, of course. So it was a very famous battle. Uh, he almost died. He was, uh, uh, he ended up in a, with the last bullet. So the book is called The Last Bullet because the Nazi handlers told the boys um, that, and, and here's a kid about my father's, this is not my father, my father is here in the back, um, but it's a child this age holding a Panzerfaust. So they were, they were provided these Panzerfaust uh, weapons, which are basically bazookas, uh, you know, anti-tank uh, anti -tank launchers. And um, they shoot, they're a single shot weapon. So they can only be shot once and then need to be discarded. So they were issued four. They were put into a foxhole with four of these, uh, a pistol and a, a machine gun. So when this battle uh, happened, the tanks, the Russian tanks started advancing and it was overwhelming. Uh, uh, he was in fact ended up left with, with the last bullet that the handle handlers had told the boys they needed to keep because they needed to use that last bullet to kill themselves rather than being taken prisoner by the Russians because being taken prisoner by the Russians was a fate worse than death. It would, it, they would be tortured before they were killed. So they needed to shoot themselves. So my father, luckily, I'm here today, so he did not do that. He made a different choice, uh, and it was an instinctive choice. He, uh, he found himself in front of a Russian kid his age, and the, the Russian kid bayoneted his leg. He was gonna stick him in the stomach, um, but he, uh, he was able, my father was able to deflect the bayonet, which sliced open his leg. Um, and he shot, he shot the Russian kid. So that's how he survived. Um, but he almost did lose his life because uh, the, the, he was losing blood very, very rapidly. Um, and uh, he was very lucky that a couple of comrades, when he, they were retreating at this point, of course, um, actually helped him to get to safety. Didi, sensitive question. Did your father ever kill somebody that was Jewish? I don't think so, be, unless they were in the Russian army. So the only people that he killed was in battle. Well, he is was presumably he the only hand to hand. Did yeah. he ever go to a camp? Oh no, he was, you know, he was he a camp. He never went to Auschwitz, no. he never went to Terrorism. He, he, never... he, not only that, he didn't actually uh, know or understand that that's what was really going on. So he found that out. In fact, when, you know, I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but you know, um, they, they, they tried to escape the Russians, you know, they weren't into retreat. Uh, their unit was completely decimated. They only had a few, uh, a few, a dozen people maybe in their unit that used to be a thousand or more. And, and they, had heard, they had learned, the, the, the officers had learned that there was going to be a, a, a division, Germany was gonna be divided into um, different zones by the allied forces. And uh, there was a zone that was going to be under Russian control and one under American control. Uh, they had heard where that was going to be. It was in a city in Austria called Lietzen. And above the bridge, north of the bridge, there was a bridge going over a river called Enns. Uh, and above the bridge was going to be the American zone, so north of the bridge and south of the bridge, the Russian zone. So they, 
uh, they went into retreat to try to get to the demarcation line and get to the American side, which they did manage. And unbeknownst to them, they actually crossed that bridge the very day the war ended. But they did not know this. They did not find this out until the next day. Um, and uh, they, they ended up giving themselves up and, um, uh, to, to the American forces. Uh, they alerted the American forces to their location, who came and eventually and picked them up. Um, and, and they were put in, in camps. They were put in outdoor camps uh, where uh, they were left in, a, in an interesting holding position because they were not prisoners of war, because the war had already ended. So prisoners who are taken after the war ends are interned persons. So they didn't quite know uh, what to do with them. And um, they, as they were being triaged, uh, he did run into an experience with, with a, uh, a, a Jewish officer, um, which, you know, you will read in the book if you're interested. Um, but uh, he was beaten within an inch of his life. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that the American soldiers did was, um, that was very common, was show the, the German uh, prisoners pictures of the concentration camps and pictures of the atrocities. And this was to my father and many of other stories that I've heard beyond belief. They could not, they simply could not believe the pictures they, the, because they were so atrocious, they were so horrendous, that they were in such utter disbelief that they had to believe that it was American propaganda against Germany. They said, no, this, this couldn't possibly be true. right? Um, and so later, so and I'm fast forwarding to when you know he was taken prisoner. Of course, then he was released to uh, to serve a year of uh, farming of compulsory farming duty. Um, he he found out after that when he was reinstated into school, he started piecing together bits and pieces, and had that conversation with his mother about the neighbors. And then he realized, oh my God, yeah, this really happened. Where did your father live as he got older? Yeah, uh, he, would, he lived in Germany. So the, the, my father stayed in Germany. He could get but, a citizenship, could, could he, here in the United oh, States? Oh, he, he never tried. He, he didn't, never tried. or he was not interested, no. He was actually interested, well, he had, at this point, he, was, he went into deep depression. He was extremely angry. He felt... What was he depressed about? He felt violated. He felt he'd been, you know, his entire world had crumbled. I mean, his, well, his, the village was completely destroyed. There was no hope, uh, you know, that he could see for anything in Germany. And, and he was n now understood that he was made complicit in, in, in atrocities beyond belief without his knowledge or, or, or consent, God forbid. Uh, and he carried that very deeply, and um, he uh, he he went into a deep dark hole, uh, uh, who that that he was helped out of um, just coincidentally by a British soldier. Uh, so after the war in 1946, first there was to be no fraternization. Germany was to become an agrarian state, and President Truman's I think it was JSC 1067 specifically said Germany was not to be rehabilitated. Uh, so there was nothing for them, right? And um, however, that, you know, started getting lifted in terms of the fraternization a little bit. And so they had these uh, sports organizations, soccer, and this British, a young British officer was in charge. And, uh, and I guess my father was a decent soccer player and spoke English. And he was one of the very few people who spoke English and he spoke it Why well. did your father speak English? He's just, he spoke seven languages, I speak five. I think it's, you know, it runs in families, I think. That was just a natural ability. He took to the English courses that he had been taught in school and he retained it and he was able to speak it. In fact, that's one of the things, you know, when he was a prisoner that, you know, uh, shows up in the book that he was one of the very few uh, who actually spoke any English and could understand what was going on. And so the British soldier uh, kind of took him under his wing and, and, and explained to him that, you know, there was a use for boys like him in the, in, in the future Germany, whatever that, that was going to be like. And, and they would need to, to reconstruct Germany at some point and that he could play a part because he was, he was, uh, smart and he could speak English and that he could 
he, he gave my father a vision of a potential future, of a potential reunited uh, uh, Germany with the rest of Europe in a, in, 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 in a democratic union. So that was just a seed of a thought, and which of course did in fact happen, right? You know, NATO came about, right? The, the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization and then the European Union. And so my father started seeing some glimpse of a potential future at that point. And then, you know, fast forwarding, he did in fact uh, decide uh, uh, at one point um, that he was going to again try to right the wrongs w in whatever manner he could uh, to ensure democracy in Europe and that the things that happened in the past would never happen again if he could help it so he became a lawyer he uh, was uh, in the Foreign Service the German Department of Defense uh, he actually was awarded the Medal of European Merit in 1979 for his work in the advancement of democracy in Europe. Uh, and then the last 15 years of his life, he joined NATO um, as, as, as an envoy of, of the foreign, German Foreign Service. And he was the head of the German NATO legal division until he retired in, at 62 in 1992. How many children did, did um, your father have? Two, just m my sister and myself. And you're yeah. the oldest or youngest? I'm, I'm the eldest, yep. Yeah. Um, my sister is 11 years younger. She was a, a surprise. What was he yeah. like as a father? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, he, I know he loved his children very much. He was, he was a kind man. Um, but you know, of course he carried an enormous amount of PTSD. Uh, of which, of course, he never spoke, because one of the things that he was told unequivocally in 1945, when he finally made it home, was that he would never speak of it again. It being what happened, the war. He was not to speak about anything ever. It didn't happen. It literally didn't happen. His own parents said, "We don't. We, you were not in this war. This did not happen. You shall never speak of it again." So how did so, you get a book? So he book? never, yep, so he never spoke of it. And he, but he would wake up with nightmares every single night. When I was that a was kid, I remember. That was the question. Yeah, every night. And my mother would, you know, just say, oh, no, it's, it's nothing, you know, it's just a bad dream. Um, it, bits and pieces sort of started coming out, you know, little things. Uh, and, and of course, you know, as I got older, in high school, I grew up in France, actually, in Paris. I went to the German School of Paris because my father was, was in the Foreign Service. And so um, we started learning about the war. So obviously, I, you know, connect the dots. I mean, he was clearly, he had been in the war, uh, in the war, living in the war, or been, and I didn't know that he had been in the war, as in he had been recruited at age 14 to become probably one of the youngest soldiers ever to be in the German army. Uh, and um, I kept asking, so I bugged him. I've, I started bugging him incessantly, uh, and not until he was in his seventies. Uh, How did he tell he, you? Did I he, don't want to talk about it. We he's like, yeah, yeah. It. He's basically, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, that's no. We're we're not talking about that. Um, and but what happened is, and I didn't know this. So yes, of course, it colored my childhood. My father was what I would call emotionally unavailable. So he was a good provider. He was there. He was clearly loved us. He was a kind man, but he was checked out. He was emotionally checked out. And, and I found out much later, in fact, when writing the book, and as I had conversations with my father in those last two years of his life, that he had to do that to protect himself, to protect his, his psyche. Like it was encapsulated someplace, right? Did the pain, the hurt. Did he feel better after he told you? Was he a different person after he knew you were writing a book? Or did he ever say to you, I don't want you writing this? No, he was actually, he never believed I would publish it, obviously. He, he didn't. He, I, told, I would tell him, I'm going to make you famous. And he would just laugh and go, oh, Heidi, just whatever. You know, so, but he thought it was, he was happy. He was happy. 
because I think when you come to be older, you know, in, in your later years, you realize that there maybe you, you think about your legacy, about what you might leave your children. And he did want us, and then he realized he did want us to know, uh, my sister and I. So he taped his recollections on 16 cassette tapes, which is what I used to write the book in, these, in, his, in his voice using his words you know obviously i edited for you know for for background and for readability and for and to give people context um but he 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 was happy he was happy and he was happy that i was interested in history and that i wanted to know and we had a lot of conversations at the end of his life so i found that i learned a lot about my father in those last few years did he ever see the book? He never did. He, he passed in 2018, uh, and I finished the book in 2020. So I was about halfway through it. It took me about four to five years to. I started in 2016. What was it like that you were writing and he physically wasn't there, that you were only relying on tapes? I had had, I mean, I had intense conversations with him. So I thought I had, I mean, obviously there are a few things I had to rely on, on other family members uh, and memories, you know, of, of my conversations that I might have had before. And also my mother, of course, my mother had a lot of background because he had, of course, spoken to her about things uh, that he never spoke to me. In fact, a few things that weren't even on the tapes uh, that my mother told me about. But the, the reason, you know, that I even started writing the book was, was just a concern uh, that he had and shared with me and I, he and I talked about uh, in 2016, which was the turn of political events, you know, the, the, the turn the world was taking, right? The, the geopolitical sort of evolution towards, you know, the pendulum shifting towards a lot of extremism, autocratic governments, you know, popping up, uh, political tensions increasing, uh, neo-fascist and, and other extremist groups starting to pop up. So he started being very concerned that his life's work was in, in danger, was in jeopardy. And that's what motivated me to, to take those tapes that I had listened to a couple of times in fascination and then put in a drawer thinking, well, I'll translate those for my children at some point. And all of a sudden it's 2016. I'd had the tapes for already seven years or eight years. And, uh, and, and that, that jolted me into motion. Heidi, is there something that you forgot to put in the book after it was published that you learned that you wish you would have put in there? Probably the only thing is the Grünebaum, the final Grünebaum story. Maybe I could have weaved it in so, you know, in the, in the afterword or, you know, at the end uh, that, uh, you know, that the sure story remains to this day and that the, and that, you know, I was able to meet the descendants and that, uh, you know, we exchange emails and, you know, and, and that was a wonderful, uh, that was a wonderful experience, really, right? So that's probably the most, you know, yes, there are other details, but that one would have been one that maybe I could have, you know, maybe, maybe in the next edition, I can add it. Heidi, do you want to add anything? This will be your final moment before <laughs> we switch gears of a daughter whose mother was in three concentration camps. Yeah, no, that is uh, probably, you know, I think it's, it's very powerful, right? That, uh, that now we can sit here, right? The descendants of, of, of people who, who were thrown into events that they had absolutely no control over, um, and, but who made decisions with their lives to, you know, to have great integrity and great ethics and, and do whatever little bit that they could to, to contribute to a better world. And, and I think that, you know, when people say, oh, there's nothing I can do, I think we can maybe all do something. I think it does matter what we do. Uh, and maybe in such little, small ways as in just helping your neighbor or, you know, whatever it is that you think you can do, uh, it does make a difference. So that's, that's what I, that's what I'll leave with. 
and and of course I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody might have so and I, and I welcome you know any comments any uh, you know anything that you your audience might like to talk to me about and, and I'm so sorry I can't be there today I hope uh, that uh, you have a lot of interesting information coming at you that that you find valuable uh, you know with my story and of course with Sandy's thank you thank you for being so supportive to this project of Ruth remember us the Holocaust we're hoping that in the near future we'll have a museum and you definitely will be speaking in our museum oh. you're the best Heidi thank awesome. you thank you so much bye bye What a pleasure to be here. My reason for writing a book is probably different than most people's. I didn't write it where I want to sell millions of copies. I knew that my mother had a very important story to tell and that, like you, Lou, and other people that write books, if she wanted to talk about it, she could. If she didn't want to, she could hand them the book. And it was so important for families to be able to recall. Uh, Sam, if you could have your father right here and you could sit with him, and you could see where we're at, or Tova, same thing with you. These are um, children of Holocaust survivors. Larry, you're in the crowd. So being able to um, um, you know, get this, this was the most important thing to me. Um, I you know, worked at Cirque du Soleil, and I was there for 20 some odd years. I also was uh, working, Jonathan, come over here with me, would you? Just come on and have a seat with me. Um, Jonathan and I have known each other, God, I hate to say this, 23, 24 years. And it's being fine for, fine for you, Blade fine Blade. for you. Being, being a ringmaster of Ringling Brothers Circus is where we met. And you know, we're around people that, are, that speak different languages and that have different cultures. And can you imagine if the circus world decided that all of a sudden, um, you know, we're not going to like this person, we're not going to get along with that person, or we're going to do the propaganda against that person. I mean, who does, who does that? Who does what happened in, in Europe? I don't get it. I don't understand it. And yet here we are, you know, to this day, embracing people from all over the world. In fact, Jonathan is such an amazing giving person, including Circus Vargas, that all Holocaust survivors are invi were invited to go see the show on Sunday, Easter Sunday, where people are coming together and, and embracing the talent of people. So if you have nothing better to do on Sunday, come join us at 2 o'clock um, at, at Circus Vargas. I do have some discount tickets up here. Um, but my, my, Jonathan and my mother became very close because you wanted to know the truth. You wanted to know about my mom. What lasting impression or impression did you have about my mother that made you who you are today? Well, I tell you, meeting Ruth was uh, really fascinating. Um, for the simple fact that I always like meeting older people at the circus because they turn into six-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first experience I had of that was my own grandfather when I began my career. And um, I was having a problem with the whole, I oh, mean, you're youngest and first black and all of this stuff. And I got to Chicago where my uncle lived and just so happened like all my family was there and my grandparents were there and uh, full house full arena the United Center Michael Jordan statue outside <laughs> and um, finished the show and I go to greet my grandparents and you know to see your grandparents coming down off this like six-year-old high is really funny <laughs> and um, my grandfather was very a very uh, uh, he was a, he was a manly man and unapologetic and he was very complimentary and he just would go on uh, he was called John 
boy, he was 27. <laughs> and uh, he just was going on and on about the show. Oh my gosh, it was so great. And boy, you sound so great. And then he stops and he goes, you know, Johnny boy, he said, I, there was a time I couldn't sit here. And the light bulb went off. He said, well, here I am. And there you are. You know, right in the center ring. So, I mean, and it was a, he and I had an interesting connection because everybody on my mother's side of the family, this is my maternal grandfather, so everyone on his side of the family, everybody can sing. It's just a thing. Everybody can sing. And I was privileged enough when I was a kid, I was in this wonderful boy choir that traveled extensively. And so he would call, and or I would send him postcards when I would travel, because uh, in the South, the big thing was quartets, quartets. So if you know of the great singers like Sam Cooke, that's where he got his start in the gospel church. The Soul Stirrers was the group Sam Cooke was with. My grandfather, legend had it, he was really, really great. Um, but, you know, he had a family, and grandma kind of was like, come on home. So, uh, but anyway, they were wonderful people. But when he told me that, it really like made everything make sense. And um, wow, there yeah. was a time right. when they couldn't, you know, the family couldn't go to the circus. Right. Why? Because of a color? I mean, yeah. hello. I mean, how how he absurd he is this? In the movement, he was deep into the movement where he escaped a lynching. They tried to lynch him, and uh, he thwarted it somehow. He was trying to unionize. But I, I say that to say this, because meeting him was like, it, it kind of gave me a sense of direction. Uh, have, like being reminded of that. And then I met Ruth. And you know, it was like, it was like this similar thing. And Oh, did she love you? Yeah. Well, she, <laughs> she was a bad girl. She was so bad. <laughs> she was so and, but that was the thing that surprised me about her, too, when I met her. Because I, I don't know why I had this thought. I was like, man, you know, I've never met a Holocaust survivor in my life. And I would just assume, you know, there would be this kind of grim spirit. That's what I thought, because it was such a horrible event. And I met Ruth, and she's this very light and lovely person. And But the way she described her experience... It was riveting, and it hit you right in the chest. But, you know, it, it was like from a person who was unrelentingly bold enough not to lose her faith. Because I remember that's what stuck with me. You know, and she said, I never, she said, I never stopped praying. I never lost faith. I never lost hope. Because this was a people thing. I never could put that on God. That was her thing to me and I remember she was rather you know she said you know she did what she could she would put sand in the bullets or whatever whatever she could you know in her own type of resistance and I can't imagine because in my teen years I was traveling the world her teen years she was had her whole world devastated and you know I just kept going to that as a man and you gotta remember along with Sam's parents yeah. Tova's parents Gerald you know, who, you, you, were, you were here last month when you had this story. Lou Pesci, mm -hmm. you're, the worlds are devastated because they have been taken from their family, their environment. Their, uh, Larry, I didn't forget you. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really important in this talk that you didn't know I was going to have you come up. But uh, I, I know, you know, I, you know, I just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we go we go way back. I mean, here I am working in for in Ringling with a bunch of Russians with a flying trapeze act. That every night, it's kind of life and death out there, and then it becomes professional life and death. And doing what we do and seeing you, it's family. I mean, it is absolute family. What we go through, you don't forget it. You just don't. And here we are today, in your way, talking about peace, in your way, talking about peace. Sam and Jan, 
from the Butterfly Project in your way of talking about peace. Ellen, as an artist, when you're doing your artwork, Ed, Ed, Edmundo, same thing with you, that you listen to what Ben had to say and did these graphics. It's really incredible and and I didn't forget you and I didn't forget you the fact that we have to figure out how we're telling this story how we're going to have a building one way uh, one day um, because we need to keep this up we need to be inviting our friends to let them know the importance of this sit tight a second Jonathan um, Max, go ahead and buzz this for me. Uh, for those of you who don't know what my mom looked like, this was her favorite saying. God created such a beautiful world, only some people make it so difficult. And, and it's true. It's the some people. It's not all the people. It's the some people. And we have to remember that. Um, Hitler wanted to attack my grandparents. Look at them. I mean, come on. What, what is this? This is crazy that somebody would think that Jewish people would be like this. Here's uh, this, the store that my grandparents had. There's my mother when she was, you know, a year old. And again, some of you have seen this. You know, my mom was raised by a nanny, and then all of a sudden, this is the one I wanted to show you. 19, you know, X amount. If you look really carefully here, you can see little Ruthie. There's little Ruthie. And then here is my grandfather. And they owned all three of these buildings. And all of a sudden, Hitler came right through here. And right at this window is when my mother saw Hitler. My grandmother you know, pulled him away. But the problem is, what do you do when you see that beautiful red flag and the black and the white and the Mercedes, all that stuff, right? It, it, was, it was this propaganda. It's this propaganda, which is so incredible. And when my mother came back, there was nothing. All she came back to was this sign that said, Holik. that was it. That was it. You know, and, and what? She ended up going into Terezin. She ended up going into Auschwitz. She ended up going into Uteron. And you're in this survival mode. But it's not just, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, it's not about the people that were in the camps. It also includes people. When you heard Jerry's story, unbelievable. Have, you know, he drank his mom's pee, okay, because he was thirsty. Or the fact that he was digging ditches. I don't want to depress you, Jerry. But the fact that he was digging ditches and sleeping in those ditches. And Lou being taken from his family. I can't hear the story enough. One thing I've learned, and we learned this, at Mundo, when we were at Comic-Con. Even when I took Ben and we were working with him as to what he was going to talk about, his daughter said, you're absolutely right, Sandy. Every time a survivor speaks, we learn something new. And that's what I miss about my mother. And that's why I adopted you and you and Ben and everyone and decided to create this exhibit. And now the word is out. The word is out that Rancho San Diego has a Holocaust exhibit. And if you go on Google right now, that thing, as Jewish people would call it, Google. But if you go to <laughs> Google, it, what happens is that you put, put in, put right in there, San Diego Holocaust Museum. Put it in. This is where we are. This has become a home to us for a year. And trust me, I'm going to hate taking this down. You're going to see a bucket of tears. Who have not seen the exhibit yet? Who has not seen it? Okay, great. So we'll make it a point that you can see it because the library closes at 7. So, um, but again, you know, robbed, absolutely robbed. And how did my mother survive this? You want to mess with my grandmother? You don't want to mess with her. But she was under 100 pounds when she got out. Thanks, Max. Go right ahead. Next one. Yep. And, and, and all of a sudden, boy, talk about stories. March 14th, 1939. We're at March 26th, right? March 14th, 1939. And, and, and you know, it, it's Einstein's birthday, my grandmother's birthday. You're supposed to be cutting a cake. Isn't that what you do on a birthday? And they put on the radio. They put on that illegal radio. They didn't turn their radio in. And you could hear that they were coming, they were coming, they were coming. My grandfather panicked. He panicked. So he went downstairs with my mother. My grandmother didn't even cut a cake, right? And all of a sudden, he goes to the supervisor, somebody you trust, somebody you love. Supervisor's wearing a swastika. Oscar, get out. They went home, right? And there were the SS waiting for him. 
and they took anything that they wanted. They took the keys to the family car. I would have loved that car, a little Praga Piccolo, put, make me gray, look like Coelho de Vil. I would have loved it. But yeah, and that was the beginning. M next, Max, and now you're stuck wearing a star. You're gonna wear a star and the star doesn't make sense. You're gonna wear a star and then you can call me a dirty Jew or call me any name that you want, but if I don't have it, right, and you know that I'm Jewish, you can beat me and kill me. So what did women do? They, they held their babies, they held their purses, right? It was, it was crazy. Next, next. And, and then came the propaganda, right? This is what was being taught in the schools. Look at this, look at this picture. We have to show you what the perfect six looks like because that's what the Jew looks like. And don't trust the Jews because they look like mushrooms. The name of the book was called Gift Pults. Now, for those of you who know me as a collector, yes, I own that original book. I own it because it's so important, not just a translation, but for people to see both on what, ha what the, the Holocaust memorabilia that I have and also the stuff that's coming to me that liberators are saying, we don't know what to do with this stuff. It's been in my family's closet. If you're up for it, I can show you something that got donated. I did bring it. Look at how Jewish people were, were, were picked. Look at that. Don't trust the Jew. I mean, come on. Nobody ever looked like that. But this is what was being taught. Next. You know the story about this beautiful woman? So Goebbels had a contest. Who is the most beautiful Aryan baby? And all these photos went in, right? And he picked a Jewish girl. She's still alive. <laughs> yep, she's still alive. Hesse Levinson, yep. And, and she does what we do. She does what you do. She's 94 years old. But you're going to ask her a question. Do you remember when the camera was clicked? No. Do you remember when? No. Right? But she was the, not the, Gerbil, not the Gerber's baby, but the Goebbels baby, right? All right, next slide. Okay, that's what my mother looked like. You can see this in the exhibit, right? A non-Jewish relative, just like what Heidi talked about, how family blood is thicker than water. So think about this. My mother's father's brother's wife was not Jewish. And she went in and collected all of the footage, all of the cameras. In fact, this particular photograph was still in the camera when my mother got liberated, right? When she came home. Oh my gosh. I know what's in that film. Nobody touched the camera, including the relatives that were killed. Next slide. And that's Terrazin. Looks like Disneyland, doesn't it? Isn't that unbelievable? That's something like that. Easy to come in, easy. And, oh, the lies they told. Do you know that my mother told me, my mother told me, what she said was there were people that were told that they were uh, going to a health spa in Terrazin. And these people were in their bathing suits. And there was no clothes for them. There was nothing for them. But the Nazis lied. They drove their cars, had their jewelry, thought they were going to a, to a health spa. They got in, but they never came out. And, um, and, and if you look at some of the photos carefully, you'll go, why? It's wintertime. Why is it so cold? And yet, they're wearing bathing suits. Well, that's one of their answers. My mother worked in a children's garden. Of course, no photography. Next. So somebody comes up and argues with me and says, no, your mother wasn't in a concentration camp. No, this is Auschwitz. This is my mother's card. That is her birth date. These are the things that we need to do in the exhibit. I can't even be, right, Jan? How many times do people come to me and they go, I have these documents and I don't know what to do with it. Yes, I'm here every Thursday, religiously, from 10 to 2. I'll come here if you want to come and have a private tour, no problem. But what do I do on my off times? I'm trying to go through people's documents, letters, the German handwriting, not the printing. And these are the things we have to do because we don't have it in San Diego. And I need your voice more than anything when it comes to this, that we must have a Holocaust museum. It needs to have a place where children can paint, that you, know, you have an office, that we run what we need to do. This is so important to us. Don't get mad at me, not a bus, but a building. Okay, next slide. 
And, and when you go into Auschwitz, when you go to the tour, when you go, when you go to the exhibit, there'll be the front room, which is called Ruth, and the back room is called Truth. And I have recreated the exact size of the sign. Look at the letter B. You see, John, remember we were talking about that, and the B is upside down. Who built that? The Nazis or the Jews? The Jews, and the, Jew, the person who made that wanted to make a statement saying, guess what? The world is upside down. The world is not right. So when you go in the exhibit, make sure you take a look at that when you go in the back room. Next. And if, when you came here, if we heard country western music or mariachi music, you'd think, okay, great, they're having good. I don't have to go check up on them, right? But think about this. You're listening to classical music in Auschwitz, right? You were greeted by classical music. And all of a sudden, people were like, well, I hear the music. Well, every once in a while, there's this nasty smoke. In fact, more than often lately, when you've talked to people. And then you realize that it was just so covered up. People in their own town didn't know what go what's going on. And that's a good lesson for you. Make it a point to know what's going on. Like, the circus coming to town. <laughs> Next. <laughs> and there's an overview of Auschwitz. I mean, who does this? You know, what it says, a gas chamber is over there and kitchen is, it's, cr it's just unreal. Next. And what did they wear? And, and so now that's what I've been, I've been on a roll to prove to my fellow uh, second generation, third generation brothers and sisters that I know I'm crazy. But I will get these uniforms. I will do whatever it takes so that we can spread the word. At first, you thought I was nuts, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Next. And then what happened is you picked clothing from the dead. See, you couldn't get these uniforms. Notice everything. No uniform. They, they were getting worn out, right? Next slide. Look at what the men wore, these poor, innocent men. Next. And then they marked you like this, well, on your piece of clothing. So next. And there's my mom in the exhibit standing next to the dress that my grandmother wore. And you could see how she was marked. It's so important for us to tell the Holocaust through personal experiences. We have to do this, because we're not machines, OK? That's what Google is for. But this is why we do what we do. Through Butterfly Project, talking about people that are alive or have passed and how kids can really focus. And then they have Holocaust survivors who come to the events. It's so amazing. OK, next slide. Look at how they slept. Next. And uh, can you imagine getting food through barbed wire? I mean, look at how, how animals, just the way they treated people. It was horrible. Next. Wait, tell the soup story, since there's a guy with a soup there. I'm getting to it. Okay, just wondering. It's coming. Can you, you, you see the items that were taken? Wedding rings. The day somebody takes my wedding ring, we're going to have a problem. The shoes that were taken, the eyeglasses that were taken. Yes, and now I'm proud to say that Remember Us the Holocaust with the Butterfly Project, we have a pair of shoes that we can show kids. This is what's so important to us. That's where your dollars are going. See, it's like, OK, we'll donate and get it rocking and rolling and everything. It's, it's, it's wonderful that this is what we need to do. So when we do go to the county, we say we have the items, but where are we going to put it? Can we go into another public exhibit or library, which I'm shooting for now? I'm trying really hard. Believe me, if I could stay here, th this would be home for me because I love it so much. Next slide. There's my mom. Max, can you play this for me? This is the last interview my mother ever made before she passed away. OK, tell me the story. The story is I got it from my grandmother, my father's side. A small ring. OK, this you got a initial. small ring this from initials. your grandmother and grandfather. A gold ring. A gold ring. And I loved it. And in Auschwitz, I had to drop it into the bucket. You took it with you to Theresienstadt. And, and I then hide it. So you hid it hid in, it. in Theresienstadt. But when you got to Auschwitz... They took it away because they shaved me. I had it in my hair. You had the ring in your hair? Mm -hmm. And then when they shaved your hair... They found the ring. They found the ring. 
Uh, did they find it or did you say, wait, let me drop this in the bucket? I don't remember anymore. It was so fast. Then. But you tied a race. Was your wonderful. Even for me. <laughs> Mama, you have to tie the ring. You tied the ring in your hair? Yeah, underneath. Underneath. Oh my gosh. When so I knew that so I knew. now, for your 38th wedding anniversary, Dad bought you this one. 36. Dad got you this. 35th, the 35th wedding anniversary that got you that one. Yeah. I said, what would you like for your present? And I said, oh, I just would like to have a plain little gold ring that has initials. Initials, right. And I'd be happy to change him from RG to RS. Wow. Because my maiden name was that. Wow. So we went to Benjamin, we ordered the ring, I came. He called me up and he said, I have it temporarily, I want you to try it, how it fits. He tried it, the size was perfect, and I he says, well, I'll call you next week when it's finished. I'll call you next week when it's finished. We, I want to polish it up. Instead, when we came, we had all the diamonds in it. And that's, that's the ring with the diamonds. My husband ordered to have his diamonds in there. Really? Stunning. R.S. Ruth Sachs. Stunning. Very cool. Show me. Show me. There we go. Yep. It's beautiful. So are you. And then two weeks later, she died. Two weeks later, she had so much to say. And when she passed, it was like, I could feel the Lou's and the Gerald's and the Ben's and people coming up to me and saying, what about us? What about us? We have a voice. And I thought to myself, why not? You were so good to my mom. You were so good to her. And now this is what we're trying to do for the rest of the Holocaust survivors in San Diego. It's not just about my mom. It's about documenting. It's about making their voice be known. Because even two weeks before she passed away, do you think I said, okay, mom, I'm gonna make a video. I need you to smile and be happy. No, it didn't work that way. It was very, very, very organic. And this is the most important thing. What I did with Heidi, you think I said to Heidi, okay, now Heidi, you know, put your makeup on, look beautiful, you know, make sure you smile, no. Everything I do is super, super organic. You, you guys know, you never know when I have the camera on you, do you? Yeah, you never know that. So anyway, if you have any questions for me, I'm here. If you have anything you want to ask me, um, I, I'm so grateful that you came to this presentation. And I know Heidi is too. And um, our next presentation is April 13th. It is a Saturday. It'll be a non-Jewish Holocaust survivor. Her name is Jill, and she will be talking about uh, what it was like on the island of Guernsey. So we have that, you know, so make sure you mark it down. It's on our county site. Very, very, oh, yeah, you, you heard, was it good? Oh, amazing. Here's this little kid on an island, and all of a sudden, Hitler just decided to round up everybody on that island. So anyway, um, go see the circus because my mother loved it. <laughs> and you could hear Jonathan, and he's so incredible. And just so you know, what a great gift to give to you that he wants us to become one on Easter Sunday, right? That we become one. Feel six again. Yeah, and feel six again, and feel six again. Right. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you her email and you're going to ask her and then the book is going to be here sam did you still want to read it because if you're still reading it then it will be donated to the library and then you'll be able to get a copy uh, of it so sam you're you're the first reader okay but i wanted to show it to you it's available on amazon and it is on amazon and if you need a bookmark absolutely i love to read it who okay who was the holocaust survivor who was supposed to be talking to heidi today me Oh, that was you. <laughs> My oh. name is Sandy Scheller. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, you're oh. so fun. I'm sorry. No, I know it was me. No, it was it was me. It was me. We were going to have a conversation, and um, 
So anyway, um, thank you, thank you. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. some people there with their backs to us that have an X on them. Yes. What was that for? Right. What happens is clothing was no longer available in the stripes and they were taking clothing from people that died. And so by putting that X on there on the back, because it's you can't get to your own back, they were imprisoned. If they didn't have that on their back, you wouldn't know the difference between a beautiful, quote, Fräulein who went to visit their husband or boyfriend or part of the Laban's you know born or whatever but that was marking them with this X and we have the dress the dress that my grandmother wore what happened is she took it she removed it after you know during liberation she put it down on the floor and this woman who was her dear friend took it and folded it and just put it away. My mother went back to Terezin for the 50 year and the liberation, the 50 year uh, celebration with other people that were in Terezin. My mother just happened to bump into, the, into her friend, I think it was like 1991 or something like that. I don't know the exact whatever, but my mother came back with this dress with an X on it and she goes, the woman said, Rutko, remember when you were at my house and grandma removed the, your, your mother removed the dress? I saved it along with all these items that my mother had. How crazy is that? So then my mother started using it as a tool in teaching. You want to see what the back looks like? There it is. Yeah. But another thing with the X was um, if they tried to run away, it was an X for. Uh, Right, it was it. It marked them. It what it did is it marked them. And it went very fast. It went very fast. It's like the paint, and it's like every Friday they stand there, and it's like one, two, bunk, one, two, bunk. It was it was fast, yeah. And that's what happened. So when you go into the exhibit, you'll see more of it in what's called the smaller truth room. And I'll see if I can spend a little time with you in there. And Larry, now you know why I didn't bring the book. I kind of had too much. But just so you know, people are bringing me absolutely unreal memorabilia. You, there are people bringing me memorabilia that you wouldn't believe. Okay, so I'm just going to start this a little bit. But if it's too much for you, you just let me know. Imagine when somebody hands me this because it's in a closet. Okay, I would rather have it than somebody else having it in the wrong hands. My goal is when we get a museum, it will be put on the floor, in the ground, under plexiglass, and you can walk and spit all you want. So I'm not going to say no to this. I'd like to tell a story about a partner of mine who was a, uh, a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz. Here in San Diego? Yes. What's his name? Maury Lieberman. Okay. Uh, I'm sitting in a, yeah, he wouldn't talk about his experiences for a long, long time. I would ask him occasional questions and he would dodge it. He was sitting in a, uh, in a bagel shop and a, uh, among the customers that came in was a woman who was wearing a, uh, a suit of mattress chicken, very fashionable. And he says to me, I have a suit <coughs> like that. Meaning when he was in Auschwitz, that's what he wore. Wow. Mattress chicken. Wow. You know, it's amazing what sparks a memory. We don't have, don't take this wrong, Lou and Gerald. Okay, I'm being realistic. We just don't have many years and every Holocaust survivor needs to be celebrated. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that they are honored and that I let the world know how honored you are because you mean so much to me. You were so close to my mom and you were all brothers and sisters surviving and you did it. And I'm so proud of you and I just love you so much. So anyway, here's to you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.